Hi friends, welcome back. We are gonna keep reading Leon and the Spitting Image by Alan Kurzweil. The last time we read, Leon was having a pretty bad day. He failed at his sewing project and he got beat up by his bully Henry Lumpkin at recess. And he decided to come back in and vandalize Henry's um, unicorn sewing project. So we will see what happens when we pick up with chapter 10, The Birdcage. The instant Miss Hagmeyer learned of Leon's radical surgery, she went straight to the phone in the teacher's lounge and called Emma Ziesel. The hotel operator answered the call after the 14th ring. Try more towers where we try more every day. How may I direct your call? Finally, I wish to speak with Emma Ziesel. Sorry, ma'am, said the operator. She has her do not disturb light on. She's probably sleeping. At 2.45 in the afternoon, sputtered Miss Hagmeyer. Get her up at once. I'm sorry, but at once, Miss Hagmeyer repeated. This is about her son. About Leon, gasped the operator. Hold on, I'll patch you right through. Emma Ziesel sat bolt upright the moment she heard Miss Hagmeyer's voice. Is Leon hurt? Is everything okay? Your son is not hurt, Miss Ziesel. However, everything is not okay. I believe you should come down to Principal Birdwhistle's office immediately. Emma Ziesel squinted at her watch. Her shift started at four o'clock, which didn't give her much time. I'll be there in half an hour, she said, pulling herself up off the living room couch, which doubled as a bed. When Emma Ziesel entered Principal Birdwhistle's office, she was frothing at the mouth, or so it seemed, because toothpaste still clung to her lips. Sorry, she said breathlessly, it took ages to find a taxi. Leon was tempted to ask what country her cab driver had come from, but he knew the birdcage was not the place to bring up his taxi driver collection. In fact, the birdcage didn't seem like a good place to discuss anything. Leon decided to keep his mouth shut. Oh, goodness gracious, don't apologize, Principal Birdwhistle said nervously. Can we proceed? Miss Hagmeyer said impatiently, without so much as a hello to Emma Ziesel. I'm on a very tight schedule. Very well, Phyllis, said Principal Birdwhistle. She turned to Emma Ziesel. At Miss Hagmeyer's suggestion, I've been looking over your son's record. He's a bright boy, there's no doubt about that. But Miss Hagmeyer is concerned that, well, perhaps it's best if she explains. Miss Hagmeyer got straight to the point. I'll be frank, Miss Ziesel. We have a problem, a serious problem. Take a look. She pulled the unicorn from her satchel, gingerly exposing its underside. Your son is responsible for this, this, Emma Ziesel burst out laughing before Miss Hagmeyer could finish her sentence. Excuse me, she said after re regaining her composure. I want to be clear about this, Miss Ziesel, said Miss Hagmeyer. Anna Mile vandalism is not to be taken lightly. If Leon did this, I'm sure he had a reason. Whose animal is it? And a mile, corrected Miss Hagmeyer. It is Henry Lumpkin's unicorn that your son mutilated. Leon's mother rolled her eyes. I know all about Henry Lumpkin. The kids call him Hank the Tank. Maybe you should worry more about how he mutilates his classmates. We're not here to discuss Mr. Lumpkin. We are here about your son. The amputated unicorn is only a symptom of a larger matter. Emma Ziesel sighed. I'm all ears. So is Miss Hagmeyer, Leon wanted to say. The classical school, Miss Hagmeyer said, places great importance on fine motor skills. And as you know, your son's capacities in that domain are seriously delayed. Here, take a look for yourself. She reached for it and handed Emma Ziesel the unicorn, along with the tape measure she pulled off her neck. If you check the basting stitch at the base of the horn, you will see your son's handiwork barely averages two stitches per inch. At the risk of stating the obvious, two SPI is entirely unacceptable. How do you know Leon did that stitching? Emma Ziesel asked. I can spot your son's limitations a mile off. And besides, he doesn't deny it, do you, Leon? Leon shook his head. Let me get this straight, said Emma Ziesel, her outrage mounting. I'm here because of my son's, what did you call it, stitch count? Correct. Emma Ziesel again wrote, rolled her eyes. I'm sorry if I don't put a whole bunch of importance on my son learning how to sew stuffed animals. Miss Hagmeyer bristled. As I have already mentioned, here and at parents' night, the word is pronounced Anna Miles. I'm not one of your students, said Emma Ziesel. More's the pity, Miss Hagmeyer muttered under her breath. Ladies, please, Principal Birdwhistle implored. Miss Hagmeyer said, I should also like to correct another misunderstanding you seem to have, Miss Ziesel. Sewing is why you send your son to classical. Whether you are aware of it or not, schoolwork is schoolwork. And from the very start of the year, Leon has not pushed himself. Seems to me he's getting plenty of pushing from others, said Emma Ziesel. Principal Birdwhistle again cut in. Ladies, I beg you, we're not here to argue. We're here to see what can be done to keep Leon engaged in the business of learning. Well, I can suggest one thing, said Miss Hagmeyer. He should get more sleep. Look at him, all raccoon-eyed and jittery. Maybe he's just bored, said Emma Ziesel defensively. Miss Hagmeyer grimaced. 
I've been called a great many things, but never boring. And it's not my teaching methods that are under review. It's the quality of your son's work. Principal Birdwhistle said, I don't mean to interfere, Ms. Ziesel, but your son does look a little tired. Emma Ziesel tensed. Suddenly, she felt attacked from two sides. Look, I work afternoons and nights to keep us going. That means I can't sing my son lullabies and I can't have cupcakes baking in the oven when he returns home from school. Heck, I don't even have an oven, just a hot plate that we barely use. She looked at her watch. Case in point, I'm expected at the reception desk in 20 minutes. Ms. Hagmeyer said, however sympathetic I might be to your circumstances, Ms. Ziesel, the fact remains, your son is lagging behind. His reports and my stitch counts make that only too clear. As far as I'm concerned, Ms. Hagmeyer, it's the teachers who should be getting the reports, not my son. Now there's an idea, Leon thought. While the three women argued, he distracted himself by composing report cards in his head. Report card for Principal Bird Whistle. Absences, zero. Conduct, fair. Performance, B minus. Comments, a hopeless wimp, should learn how to discipline nutso teachers. Report card for Coach Kasparitis. Absences, one. Conduct, good. Performance, A plus. Comments, the best. Never forces his class to do jumping jacks. Knows tons about dodgeball. Plus, he's an awesome spitter. Naturally, Leon lavished most of his mental energy on report card for Miss Hagmeyer. Absences, zero. Conduct, poor. Performance, F. Comments, total loser. Tortures her class with sewing assignments. Weird hair, possibly fake. Mean temper, big ears. Sells her students' schoolwork for big bucks. Ladies, please, pleaded Principal Birdwhistle. Let's try to end this meeting on a positive note. I wish that were possible, said Miss Hagmeyer, but even putting aside the unicorn incident, consider this. If Leon has had so much trouble with Anna Miles 1 and 2, how will he finish number 3, the unicorn, before the upcoming field trip to the cloisters? Is that necessary? Emma Ziesel asked. It is, Miss Hagmeyer said adamantly. And taking the longer view, how will Leon handle the final project of the year, the masterpiece? How, in short, will he acquire the skills needed to enter fifth grade? Leon's cheeks started to burn. Where was this going? What are you saying, Miss Hagmeyer? Emma Ziesel asked. Isn't it obvious? I'm saying there's a chance Leon and I might be reunited next year. Isn't that right, Principal Birdwhistle? The proposition seemed to catch the head of school by surprise. Yes, well, that could be beneficial, I suppose. It often proves helpful for the struggling student to repeat a year. Leon broke his self-imposed silence. No way, he shouted angrily. I'm not getting flunked. Forget it. Don't worry, sweetie, said Emma Ziesel. They're only saying it's a possibility. A very distinct possibility, Miss Hagmeyer muttered. Principal Birdwhistle smiled at Leon and his mother. Neither of them smiled back. We've got to go, said Emma Ziesel, frowning at her watch. Okay then, said Principal Birdwhistle, visibly relieved to put the meeting behind her. I've made a note to myself to send you an update on Leon's progress. As mother and son were leaving, Miss Hagmeyer said, so long, Miss Ziesel, so long, Leon. Her words would have seemed harmless if she hadn't ended the goodbye with a sewing motion to clarify that what she really meant was S-E-W, so long. Chapter 11, The Ice Queen. Napoleon hadn't expected to see two Ziesels exiting the school. He broke into a broad grin the moment he noted the family resemblance. Is this your mother, Monsieur Leon? Bonjour, madame. Emma Ziesel forced herself to smile, but Napoleon was sharp enough to sense she was in no mood to chat. He returned his attentions to Leon. So, my friend, did you have a nine and three quarters day? Leon jabbed his thumb downward. Seven? Napoleon said optimistically. Leon repeated the gesture. Five? Lower. Leon said bitterly. Napoleon shook his head. No, we had better stop there. During the drive to the Trimore, Napoleon resisted the impulse to talk, and when he pulled up to the hotel, he skipped his usual door-opening theatrics. He ended the ride with a simple, heartfelt goodbye. Au revoir, Monsieur Leon. Au revoir, Madame. Bon courage. But after the day he had had at school, the last thing Leon felt was courage. Back at the reception desk, Emma Ziesel handed her son an updated list of VIPs. Here you go, sweetie, she said. The sign board awaits. Leon looked at the sheet of names. Who cares about some dumb plumbers? I know your teacher is tough, his mother said consolingly, as she pushed the wooden letterbox across the counter. But remember our motto. She tapped the words that ran along the bottom of her hotel badge. We try more at the try more. Try, 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 said Leon. I'm sick of mottos and I'm sick of trying. What's the darn point? I'll just be trying to do next year what I'm already trying to do this year. That's not definite. Miss Hagmeyer only said that repeating the year was a possibility. Yeah, right, said Leon, a distinct possibility. Sweetie, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Leon grabbed the letterbox and stormed off to the signboard. He stabbed two V's into the black felt. They went in all crooked, but he couldn't be bothered to line them up right. 
His spelling was similarly sloppy, and as for his cherished exclamation marks, he skipped those altogether. The signboard ended up looking like this. Welcome journeymen and apprentices, plumbing and pipe fitting industry, local 51, Providence. Later that night, after a coffee shop sandwich that failed to make the grade, Frau Hafenreffer had forgotten the extra J on his PB&J, Leon let himself into his apartment and plodded into the bedroom. Without bothering to flick the light switch, he didn't have to, the neon glow from the convention center sign lit up his small room, he flopped onto the bed. He felt as if he had weights tied to his arms and legs. It was a struggle, just changing into pajamas. As he got under the covers, an annoying phrase started looping through his head. Try more, try more, try more. Then another phrase, this one even more annoying, took its place. Repeat the year, repeat the year, repeat the year. Soon the two phrases tangled together like twisted strands of thread. Try, repeat, try, repeat, try, repeat. Leon sat up in bed and studied the map of the world. He hoped the pins marking his past achievements would temper his crummy mood, but they only made things worse. He hadn't added a new country in weeks and weeks. At this rate, he would never nab Suriname. He reached under his bed for a bag of Zapp's kettle-cooked mesquite barbecue potato chips he kept on hand for emergency situations. But even potato chips failed to lift his spirits. Just when he thought things couldn't get worse, the map pins began to vibrate. Click, 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 buzz, grind, groan, rumble, crash. The Ice Queen was at it again, casting her odious spell. Leon dropped the chip bag on the floor and shoved his head under the covers. He knew that the Queen were, would repeat her hex. And sure enough, she did. Only, instead of the predictable clicks and buzzes, she now emitted an entirely new set of sounds. Leon listened intently. An odd assortment of bangs, scrapes, and thumps replaced the usual three-click overture. What is going on? he wondered. Leon jumped out of bed and tiptoed into the hall. When he reached the alcove that abutted his bedroom wall, he discovered the Ice Queen had company. Two burly hotel guests had their shoulders pressed against the side of the ice maker. A little to the right, Solly, one of the men said between gasps. The man he'd addressed, Solly, responded by rocking the massive machine. How's that, Polly? Over more to the left. The two men, Polly and Solly, were so focused on moving the machine they didn't notice Leon. What are you guys doing? He demanded. The men eased the ice maker back into the carpeting and straightened up. What are you doing, kid? Said the man named Polly. Shouldn't you be home sleeping? I can't sleep. And for your information, Leon added defiantly, this is my home. I live right next door. He tapped the wall. Yeah? Then I ain't surprised you can't sleep, said Polly. Not if you live near this baby. He gave the Ice Queen an affectionate slap and looked at his pal. Are you surprised, Solly? Ain't surprised at all, said Solly. Polly turned to Leon. See, the bozo who did this install totally messed up on the clearance. Ice Queens ain't supposed to touch the wall. Don't forget about the venting, Solly interjected. I ain't forgetting about the venting, said Polly with mild irritation. If you'd let me finish telling the kid. As I was about to say, the venting is whacked. Also, something's wrong with the harvest bin. Plus, from what I'm hearing, I wouldn't be surprised if the compressor's out of alignment. Solly nodded respectively. You guys sure know lots about ice makers, said Leon. The two men smiled at each other. Hey, Polly, said Solly. Do we know lots about ice makers? Polly chuckled. Enough to have earned the stars. As if on command, both men patted the patches on their work shirts. Leon looked more closely. Their patches said, Master Plumber, United Association of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters, Local 51, Providence, and were rimmed with a circle of stars. They don't hand these out for looks, kid, said Solly. Are you guys saying you can fix the ice queen? That prompted more chuckling. Sorry, kid, said Polly. I know where you're going with this, but no can do. Solly and me, we're here for the toilet tank convention. Call your local refrigeration professional if you want this baby overhauled. We're done for the night. My mom's tried getting her fixed, said Leon. She couldn't find anyone. Well, she is a relic, Polly admitted. The ice maker, I mean, not your mom. Please, Leon pleaded. There was no way he was going to let an opportunity like this slip through his fingers. She keeps me up all night. The ice maker, I mean, not my mom. Polly again let out a chuckle and rubbed the back of his neck. Hey, Solly, he said, how'd you get down to the city? How do you think Polly took the van? Got your tools with you? You kidding, Polly? I always got my tools with me. Well, go get him. And while you're at it, bring up some of that high density insulation, a length of thread pipe, and 10 feet of 3 8 inch feeder line. You got it, said Solly. And don't forget the donuts, Polly joked. Not so fast, said Leon. Donuts are my department. He tore down to the coffee shop and arranged some goodies on a plate while Frau Happenrapper poured out two cups of coffee to go. 20 minutes later, the two repairmen had cracked open the ice queen. Coils, screws, wing nuts, tubes, and o-rings spread over the shag carpeting, along with donuts, napoleons, and cups of piping hot coffee. See, kids, said Polly, just like we told you, the compressor is all messed up. 
Don't forget the harvest bin, said Solly. Plus, like Solly here says, some dimwit inserted the harvest bin backward. Polly and Solly spent the better part of an hour unplugging, uncoupling, unscrewing, cleaning, lubricating, repairing, and realigning parts. Once that was done, they snapped everything back in place and repositioned the ice maker three feet from the wall. Go ahead, kids, said Polly. Test her out. She's awfully quiet, Leon said doubtfully. Are you sure she's plugged in? Is she plugged in, Solly? She's plugged in, Polly. Leon pushed the dispensing lever and braced himself for the usual racket. It never came. There were no clicks. There were no buzzes. There were no grinds or groans or crashes. In fact, the ice queen dropped two ice cubes into Leon's cupped hand without making any sound at all. None whatsoever. Wow, Leon exclaimed. Wait till I tell my mom. That repair's been in the logbook for years. Tell her tomorrow, kid. Right now, go grab some shut-eye. Leon didn't argue. It was late and he was tired. That night, he fell asleep thinking about the Ice Queen. She wasn't at all like the one in the fairy tale, he decided. She wasn't an evil witch. She was just a weird, cranky, out-of-date curiosity in need of special handling. And that is where we are going to leave it for today. So we will see. You know, he's got one of his major life problems fixed. So we'll see if anything starts to improve for Leon. See you guys tomorrow.